والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I send peace and blessings to the last Prophet Muhammad, his family, his companions, all those who called to his way, all those who established his sunnah to the day of judgment. And I begin with the greeting words of paradise, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in his final Arafat sermon, highlighted to his followers the need to take the message to all parts of the planet. And so he left the responsibility on the Ummah, on the nation of Islam. No other prophets were to come. No other messengers were to come until the Day of Judgment. And it was the duty of Muslims to take this message all over the planet. Despite the fact that Muslims in some countries were striving and giving the message, in some countries they were not. Islam has succeeded in spreading to the far reaches of the earth. Islam has never stopped, and despite political corruption that entered into the Muslim world, and attacks by crusaders and propaganda against Islam, it continues to spread. And every day we are finding out of another far off land where the message of Islam has reached. In the chapter known as Surah Al-Saf in verse number 8, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has told us, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْكَافِرُونَ They intend to put out the light of Allah with their mouths. But Allah will bring his light to perfection, even though the disbelievers may despise it. In this case, nor Allah, the religion of Allah, the Qur'an, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah has promised to bring it to perfection. And so Islam reached far off lands. And when we compare the histories of the world, when we unlock information, we find some amazing cases of contact between Muslims and people in far off and distant climates. One case is the case of the North, the people of the lands of Scandinavia. These people in the past were known as Vikings. And the Viking people or Viken people were originally people of the fjords. And the fjord is a small inlet which goes in from the sea into the land itself. But the Vikings became known and were synonymous as pirates. And this Viking ship that you see um, was a, a source of fear for many people in the world. The Vikings were able to reach far distances because of their nautical abilities and because of their great courage. If you look at their countries, you will see that the Vikings were divided into three major kingdoms. The Norwegian Vikings um, of Norway went to the UK, Greenland, and Canada. <clears throat> they were well known for Leif Erikson, who was one of the people who uh, landed in America long before Columbus. In Denmark, the Danish Vikings, they traveled to Germany <clears throat> Spain and the Mediterranean. The Swedish Vikings from Sweden traveled to Russia, Bukhara, Samarkand, the Black Sea, 
Turkey, and Iraq. And it is the Swedish Vikings who are the subject of our discussion today. What we find out is that the Swedish Vikings controlled uh, from the 8th century the trade routes uh, from Russia to the Caspian Sea, uh, and they also controlled the Black Sea. These areas were rich in slaves, in furs, and in skins. And the Vikings, uh, because of their fighting abilities and because of their, uh, uh, their ability to go long distances uh, in their ships and, and to withstand the cold and, and the severe climates of this region, were able to dominate the area and to literally control the trades. What is interesting to us is that in the 10th century, an Arab diplomat named Ibn Fadlan uh, came into the region and he actually described in his writings the Viking people. In one uh, description, he said that they were generally tall and blonde and a reddish type of color. He said that the men had beards. There were long beards and there short beards and the women generally put their hair into braids. Ibn Fadlan also gives a description. He said around 920, he said uh, after encountering the Vikings along the Volga River, he said these Vikings were the dirtiest creatures in God's kingdom. And so the Vikings give us strange descriptions. And the Vikings were a people uh, who were, through their courage and, and through their lack of care for their own lives, were able to go to far distances. Here we see um, an, an Arab uh, heater that was used in the 8th century in homes uh, by the Vikings themselves. Now, in terms of the relationship uh, of the Vikings to the Muslims, it appears that during the uh, Abbasid uh, Khilafat, especially in Baghdad, and also in the regions of Samarkand and Tashkent in what is now southern Russia, that the Vikings were being used as bodyguards, they were used to protect uh, the sea routes, and sometimes they were mercenaries uh, within um, the, the, the troops of armies. And so because of this, and because of their pirate abilities, and they were probably also stealing wealth uh, wherever they possibly could, um, today in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and when you get the literature from the National Archives, you find that it says that more than 1,000 silver treasures of the Viking Age have been found in Swedish soils. So literally in people's farms, when they are building buildings and going down into the ground, they are excavating huge treasures of silver and gold coins from around the world. But what is astonishing about this is the fact that the majority of these coins are actually um, from Arab lands, Muslim coins. And so it is said that over 70,000 coins found in Scandinavia or in, in Sweden in particular have Arabic on them. And you'll find on the coins, you will literally find um, uh, writing, Arabic writing, you'll find Kalima la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah written on the coins. You will also find um, the names of the different uh, khalifas or the rulers who are in the, in the particular areas. You will find uh, not only silver, um, but you will also find gold. And um, these coins are extremely interesting because uh, in, in, in most cases um, the coins are are done in such, such a beautiful way that the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is clearly written on the coins. And generally, these coins will not have images on them. It has the Arab texts. And surprisingly enough, there are literally coins that have been found dating back to 622 AD. So, coins have been found in Sweden dating back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad So this, is, this means that, that coins coming back from the early 
Khilafat of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an, and then from Umar's time, from Uthman's time, from Ali's time, may Allah be pleased with them, can be found high in the north amongst the Scandinavians. In the 9th and 10th century, um, silver dirhams were coming from Tashkent from, and Samarkand uh, in Russia. And um, this is a coin. I actually was able to purchase a coin on a journey to Scandinavia. And um, it has La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah on one side. And on the other side, it actually has um, the name of the ruler. And we were able to decipher from this coin that it was a Sultan uh, Abu Sarwan. Uh, this is written in the Arabic language. And um, it looks, it appears to be dated back uh, to about 1,000 years ago. So this was an amazing find. I, I went into a coin shop and I asked for Arabic and he sold this coin to me for only 50 US dollars. Uh, but this is a treasure that I will treasure for the rest of my life. And um, it is another uh, gem of wisdom which is available today if we would only look and search for our heritage and let other people know about the beauty uh, of Islam in this world. If we continue on in history, we'll find a connection between the Ottoman Empire and the Swedish Vikings. The Ottomans sent diplomats to live in Sweden and they establish cordial relationship with the people of the north. And so we find that the people within Scandinavia looked upon Muslims as an advanced uh, civilization. It was not a negative relationship because they were far in the north and they were able to uh, develop a, a cordial understanding with Muslims. This has led to uh, people accepting Islam in Scandinavia in large numbers. And so today in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, in Finland, all throughout the Scandinavian countries, we find thousands of northern people, descendants of Vikings, uh, coming into Islam. Now, what is surprising about this is that the majority of the people embracing Islam are women. And when I had the opportunity to go to Norway and to Sweden and to meet the Scandinavian Muslims, I was shocked to see that, that most of the Muslims were women and usually Islam gets a very bad uh, uh, coverage concerning the position of women. But what they said was, if Muslim men are practicing Islam, and of course this is with a condition, if Muslim men practice Islam, then they are the last hope for the family in the world. So therefore the Muslim men who cultured their families, who took care of their children, who respect uh, uh, their women, who practice Islam, who act like men, then they are able to, to marry in the north and the communities are becoming very large and, and very thriving uh, all throughout the Scandinavian region. This again is very important information and it is part of a broadening understanding of the relationship of Muslims to people living off in far distant areas. We recognize the past and know that the Vikings at one point were a terrible people, a feared people, but now they are entering into Islam. Let us come back after a few moments and look at other areas where Islam is reaching. <laughs> If you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to not only the 20th century, the true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth.
message of Islam in the 21st century is an ever-expanding one. And we find that despite the great confusions and upheavals that have happened in some of the major capitals of the world, despite the negative propaganda, Islam as a way of life continues to affect people throughout the planet. I had the opportunity to travel far into the north uh, to a place called Alaska. And we found in Alaska, in F Fairbanks, Alaska, we found Muslims making Juma, and we found Inuit people known as Eskimos who were coming into Islam. It was interesting that when contact was made with the Eskimos, they, when hearing the message of Tawheed, had to say, I mean, what took you so long? And so when you go north into those regions, you'll find that people are still thirsty to hear about the oneness of God and to hear about the finality of the prophethood. Even to the point where information has come to us that far in the north, in what is now known as the North Pole uh, section of Canada, that there are Muslims who have established an Islamic center. You can pray Salatul Juma in the North Pole in probably one of the coldest areas in the world and also in an area where you are living in the land of the midnight sun. And when Muslims went into that region uh, recently as in the past, they found that there are certain times during the year when the sun never sets. If you go there in, in, the, in the summer, especially in June, you'll find long periods of times, days, where at midnight the sun is out. And so, if it is the month of Ramadan, how do you fast? You will literally be saw him 24 hours um, for almost uh, close to a month. And so, um, when the scholars looked at this, and the fact that in the winter season, it is dark constantly, so you cannot make your salat, then they went back to the, had to the had sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu um, when the Prophet was speaking about the time of Dajjal and, and speaking about the fact that, you know, and during this time when, uh, um, you know, things would be strange, a day would be like a year, a day would be like a month. And they asked, you know, O Messenger of Allah, if we reach a time like this, when everything has, is upside down, how do we make our salat? Then the Prophet said, Iqdaru lahu qadra that you should make taqdeer, that, that, that you should make a, a, a basic equivalent. So therefore what is happening in the northern countries is that they are following um, the closest reasonable city. And so they take the times of Fajr and Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib and Isha in this near uh, city and they use those times and when the Salat time comes in on their watch, then they make their salat. If this is not used, then it is also stated by some of the ulama that you can use Mecca al Mukarramah as the center of Islam, use the times in Mecca, and then uh, establish your time. What is interesting though, again, is that Muslims have spread to far distances, and that Islam is vibrant and has solutions for all problems, regardless of temperature, regardless of climate or environment. Even if we look at the igloos of the Inuit people, the Eskimo people, um, the, the igloo is already shaped like a masjid and it just needs a minaret. It is also reported uh, recently that Muslims are coming into Islam in New Zealand, that the Maori people, who are known for their rugby players, the All Blacks, and, and known for their, their, their powerful traditions, uh, of physical strength and, and their uh, uh, warlike strong personality that they are coming into Islam in large numbers and teachers are needed to go down into the area of New Zealand. Reports are also coming now that in Central America, in Mexico, in the southern part of the United States, the Southwest, that Spanish speaking people are entering into Islam. This is a phenomenon that is shocking many uh, historians and many people who watch the changes in culture. Because it was the people of Spain, because of the conflict that went on between the Muslims in Al-Andalus and between the conquistadores, the conquerors who came from the north, 
because of that negative interaction and because of 200 years of fighting, um, traditions within Spanish culture actually demonize Muslims. And so it was almost unbelievable uh, when reports started to come about uh, Hispanic people entering into Islam. But it is all part of the legacy of uh, this message that it is uh, set up in such a way that once the veils of ignorance are taken off the eyes of the people, that um, the individual is able to enjoy Islam and to benefit from the principles of Islam and to maintain the original culture that they came from. So Hispanic people are accepting Islam uh, in the Caribbean region, in Central America, in Mexico, and this is part of the uh, legacy that is coming into the 21st century. In uh, the United States, uh, we find up until now that amongst African American people, we find that Islam is still spreading rapidly. Despite um, the negative confrontations that have gone on in the early, early part of the 21st century, uh, masjids are still functioning and thriving within the United States. Uh, people are still coming to question about Islam. And even after the great upheavals that happened in New York and in London, um, which uh, we recognize are not really part of the legacy of Islam, because of these upheavals on September 11th and also in, on July 7th in London, uh, many people have begun to ask about Islam. So we find um, in the capitals of the United States, um, in Canada, in many of the Western countries, uh, we find people asking about um, the Qur'an and what is Islam and, and, and who are the Muslim people and, and what is the truth about this religion? Why does it spread so far? Why are people still uh, accepting this religion up until now? In all parts of the world, Muslims have been able to enjoy their faith. In all parts of the world, Muslims have been able to reach out to those who were not blessed with an understanding of Islam from their birth. And so, when we look at the gems of wisdom throughout history, when we look at the spread of Islam from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, up until now, we recognize a great legacy coming out of this faith. We recognize the fact that Tawheed itself, that the oneness of God, unity in the concept of the Creator is a central issue which is a need within every human being. Wherever you are born, however you are raised, everybody recognizes that when the sun rises, that when the sun sets, that when the rain is falling, there is a creator in back of this. Everybody has a need within themselves to recognize a higher power, whether they want to call it nature, or whether they call it dialectical materialism, or whether they call it the force, whatever they are calling it, they recognize a higher power. When the tornado strikes, when the tsunami strikes, we sit back, we realize there is a force which is above all of us. So Tawheed gives to people a, a form of communication with that force. Tawheed also gives inclusion. So people of different nationalities, of different colors, are able to function together. And so we find that from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, up until now, that Islam has affected all races. It has affected all continents. It has affected people of different classes, people of different nationalities, and people of different understandings. Through Tawheed, Islam was also able to bring together science, knowledge of all types, mathematics. Muslims were able to benefit from the knowledge of the ancient ones, from the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Phoenicians, the ancient Mesopotamians, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Greeks and Romans. All of the great scholars of the past left a legacy, and Muslims were able to benefit from this legacy 
because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Al Hikmah Dalat al Mu'min, that wisdom is the lost property of a believer. Anywhere he finds it, he is most deserving of it. And so, with this understanding, Muslims were able to bring together spiritual life with material life. Muslims were able to bring together church and state. Muslims were able to bring together different tribes and different nations. We saw in the spread of Islam to Al-Andalus, we saw the peak of civilization. We saw a society that was leading the world in technology, leading the world in philosophy, bringing together races of, from all different parts of the world. And we found out that the great kings and queens and, and uh, leadership in Europe and other parts of the world would send their children to Cordoba, to Toledo, to Seville, to Granada, to Valencia, in order to raise their understanding in this world and to enable them to come up in their lives. We also recognize the fact that within Muslim Spain, within Al Andalus, when Muslims left the message, when they started to become corrupt and they drank wine, and they began to involve in adultery and fornication. When the white tried to overcome the black and the black tried to overcome the white, when the Arabs were fighting the non-Arabs, when the non-Arabs fought back against the Arabs, when a Persian was not comfortable with a Turk, when a European was not comfortable with an African, then Muslims lost the light. It was taken away from them and it went to the hands of another people. We found out, however, that far across the desert, in Timbuktu, that Muslims were able to develop another great civilization, and that despite the fact that they were so remote, great scholars from around the world visited Timbuktu. We found out that Muslims were affecting the world, whether they were free or whether they were slaves. And we recognize that Islam is coming into the future. That great personalities in places like America, like Malcolm X, who we see in this picture in the clothes of the ulama, the clothes of scholars. What is he holding in his hand? A book. He is holding the book of Allah. And so that is the key. Education, submission to the Creator, and following the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. We have opened up many treasure chests for you, and we pray that this knowledge would not go in vain, but that it would open up more untold stories from world history, and that this world can live eventually in a state of peace and justice. I leave you with these thoughts. I ask Almighty God to have mercy on me and you, and I leave you in peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.